So next, uh, uh, Sean Wei Fan, uh, professor of electrical engineering at Stanford and a, a dear colleague of mine um, who I've had the pleasure of working with in the past since my days at, at Lockheed and uh, currently on the DARPA Quest program. Um, and so th thank you for, uh, I'm not good at introductions as I seem to say every time, but you know, thank you for joining us, Sean Wei. Uh, he's gonna talk about non-reciprocal thermal radiation and how you can, uh, you know, what is the limit you can do with a solar cell and maybe get to how does he view light? How does he view photons? Uh, that's actually what I sort of challenged him to think about, which is a hard thing to talk about, but uh, maybe it might touch a little bit on that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, thank you, Sean Wei. Let me change up. And is it okay if I record your talk? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, you can, uh, you can record. Can you hear okay. me well? Yes, yes, I can. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah. Uh, all right, so I'll start then. Oh, have you started recording or? Sorry. Ram, you, yes, I'm recording, yes. Okay, yeah, all right. Uh, so I'll start. Uh, uh, thanks, Charles, for inviting me. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to come to this, uh, uh, I would say somewhat unusual and actually pretty informative workshop. Um, I will talk about a uh, talk about a subject that has been uh, we've been pursuing uh, for a number of years, at least thinking about it a number of years, and that is uh, non-reciprocity and its relation to the ultimate limit of solar and thermal energy harvesting. So uh, here's a brief outline. I'm going to talk about uh, the theoretical background, the uh, foundational theoretical work that people have carried out in trying to understand the ultimate limit of solar energy harvesting. Then I'm going to uh, talk about uh, our work uh, in developing structures to break Kirchhoff law and why that's important in the context of trying to reach the ultimate limit of solar energy harvesting. And at the very end of the talk, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a unusual aspect of uh, heat transport uh, in these non-reciprocal systems we call thermal supercurrent and the, the implication of these kind of supercurrent uh, in thinking about fundamental thermodynamics issues. So uh, this is going to be a more extended talk of uh, compared with the talks that I'm usually give, and I hope to give a bit more background uh, as we go along. Let me start with the first part on uh, theoretical background. Uh, certainly uh, from a fundamental point of view, uh, it is important uh, to understand what exactly is the ultimate thermodynamic limit uh, that you can get uh, for harvesting energy from the sun. How much work, how much electricity you can in principle generate uh, from sunlight. And for that purpose, uh, you, uh, the simplest model you can think of the sun is that is a black body. So a black body at 6,000 Kelvin. And therefore you need to understand something about black body radiation. And so for a black body at a temperature T, uh, it is well known that the power density that is generated, uh, it will generate uh, scales as T to the four with a constant that's a Stefan, uh, related to the Stefan Boltzmann constant. But to understand the energy harvesting limit, you would need to convert these photon flow and the heat in these photon flow uh, into work. And therefore you need to talk about the entropy in the black body radiation. And this is not as familiar, but it's a well-established result as it turned out that the entropy in the black body radiation uh, has the simple formula of four over three times the energy flow divided by the temperature of the black body. So uh, th this, a uh, formula uh, can be derived in a number of ways, but here's a simple check. The uh, entropy flow divided by the energy flow uh, in equilibrium has to be uh, equal to the inverse temperature. And that's one of the basic thermodynamic results. And uh, therefore, uh, because the energy flow has the T to the force dependency, uh, the entropy flow you can put this entropy flow into this formula 
to convince yourself that it actually satisfies this formula. And in here, the four over three factor comes simply from the fact that the energy flow has a T to the fourth dependency. So it's a simple one on algebra. This four over three factor turned out to be extremely important in understand the uh, fundamental limit of solar energy harvesting. Uh, in comparison, the conductive heat flow does not have this four over three factor. In other words, the photon heat flow actually has excess entropy that's, that's be, that it carries as compared to regular conductive heat flow. So now with this, one can think about the entropy issue in the light absorption and emission process. In the light emission process, we imagine that we have a black body being maintained at a particular temperature T. We feed it with an input energy flux that's just enough to balance out the outgoing energy flux. So in, that's enough to keep the black body at the temperature T, but we can talk about the entropy issue. In this case, the incoming entropy flux is the conductive heat flow that doesn't have the four over three factor. The outgoing photon heat flux, on the other hand, carries the four over three factor. So as a result, a light emission process like this in fact is an inherently non-equilibrium process. It generates excess entropy at a rate that's equal to the entropy difference here, which is a third times sigma t to the three. Generating entropy in a process uh, is uh, perhaps not too surprising. Uh, in fact, uh, anything that uh, non-equilibrium process typically generates some entropy. And in this case, uh, it is perhaps not too hard to imagine that light emission process should generate entropy, uh, since in this case, we're emitting to vacuum. And therefore, you can imagine this is like an expansion of a photon gas. But on the other hand, you can look at the reverse process of the light emission process, and, uh, and that's the light absorption process. So just reverse all the arrows. So in this case, you have a radiated heat flow coming in, and uh, the amount of energy that get absorbed by black body is then dissipated out uh, by conductive heat flow to an environment. And so again, you do the energy balance between the incoming radiative heat flow and the outgoing conductive heat flow. And they balance out to maintain the black body at a particular temperature. And in this case, again, you can look at the entropy balance. The entropy outflux from the conductive heat flow will be sigma t to the third, but the incoming photon carries a entropy of four over three sigma t to the third. So the inevitable conclusion is then that the light absorption process in fact remove entropy from the universe. And this is a very unusual statement that the light absorption process actually can remove entropy. And uh, uh, I must admit that I have never been uh, comfortable with this particular statement, even though the math is a one page of math, uh, it is very hard to see microscopically where the entropy removal come from and whether the entropy removal process is consistent with second law of thermodynamics. And uh, so uh, not surprisingly, uh, this there has been uh, debate, therefore, about the entropy formula that I talked about uh, and in fact, it is informative if you're interested in this kind of stuff uh, to take a look at this particular uh, comment uh, that was uh, uh, published by uh, DeVos uh, against a paper published by Wolfo uh, to debating on the issue of this entropy in photon heat flux. Um, I won't go into detail uh, about this, this particular paper, but uh, just by commenting that 
the people involved uh, in both sides of this debate uh, are people that have done uh, really made foundational contribution to the uh, issue of uh, solar cell efficiency limit. Uh, so it's interesting to see what their perspectives are. But the literature seems to have to settle into the following resolution about the entropy removal argument. And as a typical, as a good scientist, when you see a difficulty, you bypass. It. So uh, the idea is to say, well, uh, you don't have to worry too much about what happens in the individual process. Uh, instead, you should consider the entire process of emission absorption. So imagine that you have a black body exchange with another black body at a temperature uh, and uh, going through photon exchange. In this case, you have an entropy generation process on the emission side and the entropy removal process on the absorption side. Now, uh, if you forget about your uneasiness about entropy removal, you can say, well, let me sum the total entropy uh, balance. In this case, then you get a four over three factor of uh, entropy generation that look like this, entropy flow that look like this, and this is larger than the conductive entropy generation, which is required by the second law. So therefore, if you take into account both emission and absorption, uh, then there's no issue that the total process generates excess entropy and therefore you have no second law implication. So uh, starting from this, you can then derive the fundamental limit of solar energy harvesting in terms of work. So what you do is you imagine that you have a net photon heat flux coming into an ideal heat engine and that photon carries energy and entropy flow. And then you imagine this heat engine will remove the, the entire entropy influx through conductive heat transfer to an environment at a temperature of your ambient. And, the, and the, that's associated with a particular heat flux. That's the minimum heat flux that's required to remove this entropy. Once you pay this energy cost, the remaining part of the energy can be used as work. One of the things you can do with background, you can do oh, it. Okay. Sorry? Okay. Yeah. So uh, the, in doing so, uh, you can then compute what's called the exergy of the photon heat flow. And the exergy basically is the incoming energy flow minus the minimum amount of heat flow that you need to pay to remove the entropy in the uh, incoming photon flux. And when you do that, you through the exergy and take the exergy divided by the incoming photon flux, you derive this very well-known Langsberg limit. And this Langsberg limit for a sun at 6,000 Kelvin and the ambient at 300 Kelvin give you an efficiency of 93.3%. And this is uh, widely believed to be the ultimate limit in terms of efficiency of solar energy harvesting it is below the Carnot efficiency limit between, this temper, between these two temperature, which for 6,000 Kelvin and 300 Kelvin would have been an efficiency of 95%. And it is below this because the incoming photon flux carries excess entropy beyond what the second law typically would require. Therefore, it is below the Carnot limit. Now, this derivation was provided by Langsberg in a very well-known paper in 1980. Uh, one of the questions is what exactly is the, at least the theoretical device configuration that's required in order to reach the Langsberg limit? In other words, how do you think about constructing this ideal heat engine that absorbs the photon and then generate just enough heat to the environment in order to get the exergy of the photon heat flow. 
And there's a very important paper written by Reese that provide the first device configuration that showed that you can reach length limit. Uh, to me, I think it's also an indication that this treatment about exergy, in fact, is correct despite my uneasiness about the entropy removal process. So the way the Reese engine work is that it take a bunch of circulators and also a bunch of Carnot engines. And these you can think of as an idealized, for example, thermoelectric or thermal uh, or a thermal engine of any kind. So you imagine the sun coming in. Part of the sunlight, the sunlight is completely absorbed by the first absorber. And then you use the, a little bit of the heat of the absorbed sunlight heat to drive an engine, Carnot engine, that operates between the absorber and the ambient to get work. The most of the heat, however, radiates back out. And when it radiates, you put in a circulator, which is a non reciprocal device, so that the radiation does not go back to the sun, but instead go to the second absorber, and then you repeat the process. And then you do that by, then you optimize, oh, then you optimize the temperature of these absorber to maximize the efficiency. As it turned out, when you do that, the temperature difference between each of these absorbers are infinitesimal. The first absorber here has the temperature of the sun, and the last absorber here has the temperature of the ambient. And if you do this calculation, the Lambsberg limit comes up. So uh, in a very informative title, uh, Reese pointed out that this gives you complete and reversible absorption of radiation because he has constructed an engine which does not add any entropy in addition to the entropy content that's inherent in the photon exchange between the ambient and the sun. And the other thing that turned out to be quite important in Reese construction is that he used circulators. And this is a non-reciprocal device. Uh, by non-reciprocity, it means that the process of coming in and going back out is different. And uh, it is known that, in fact, if you work out the limit for reciprocal device, the efficiency is below this. So the non-reciprocal device is actually essential. So uh, this provides a theoretical background of what we like to talk about. In other words, uh, what we would like to do talk about in this talk is uh, build upon Reese's work and ask, uh, is there a simpler device configuration that allow you to reach Langsburg limit? And uh, uh, as you can imagine, uh, this seems to be a very elaborate setup. A circulator is something that you can buy uh, of course, ideal Carnot engine is not something that you can uh, easily obtain. Uh, and so uh, if nothing else, and also this is a very complicated device configuration. So if nothing else, you'll be interesting to see if there's a way to construct maybe at least conceptually a simpler configuration to reach the length burden. So uh, with that as a background, uh, now uh, the pathways that I'm gonna show you towards reaching the Langsburg limit in a simpler configuration comes in in trying to break reciprocity in thermal radiation. If you open any textbook on thermal radiation, there's the well-known Kirchhoff law, which says that the absorptivity and the emissivity must balance in a frequency by frequency and angle by angle fashion. And this is, so in other words, the absorptivity for a ray that's coming in this way must be equal to the emissivity of this ray back in this direction. And this is very much re com uh, commonly referred to as the detail balance. And it is a very widely used in 
uh, thinking about thermal radiation. It is important, however, to point out that in spite of its importance, the detail balance, in fact, is not a fundamental law coming from the second law of thermodynamics, but rather come from the fact that the most of the emitter that you have, in fact, satisfy reciprocity. And breaking this Kirchhoff law of thermal radiation, in fact, is quite important for thermal energy, for solar energy harvesting. And uh, as a simple illustration, uh, suppose you would like to design an efficient solar cell so that you can efficiently absorb light from the sun. Now, if you satisfy Kirchhoff law, that means it must also be an efficient emitter back to the sun. And the energy that get, if, that get emitted back to the sun does nothing to your solar energy harvesting and represent an intrinsic loss mechanism. So therefore, uh, to reach the ultimate limit of solar energy harvesting, what you like to do is that you have a cell that absorbs very efficiently from the sun, but when the cell emits, it doesn't emit back to the sun, and instead it emits elsewhere, so you have a second chance of harvesting those energy. If you think about Reese configuration that I've just talked about, it is precisely the circulator that does this research recycling of photon in his configuration. So in order to do so, therefore, one would need to break the Kirchhoff law. And uh, as I have just argued, the Kirchhoff law, in fact, is not a requirement of the second law of thermodynamics. Rather, it comes only because the emitter that we are used to seeing are made of reciprocal materials where its dielectric function is a symmetric tensor. And they are materials uh, called magneto-optical material with asymmetric permittivity tensor. And these are materials that are widely used in circulators and isolators. So uh, in fact, in the circular, in the isolator, for example, uh, it's quite common to design an optical device where the transport coefficient in two reciprocal pathways are different. For example, uh, one can imagine designing a non-reciprocal lossy medium, and I've shown you, I'm gonna show you an exact uh, example in a second, where the reflectivity from left to right is different from the reciprocal reflectivity of light coming from right to the left. And uh, uh, this can be used as a standard optical device called optical isolator. Uh, but there are very interesting thermodynamic consequences associated with this kind of non-reciprocal optical response. So as an illustration, you can imagine this non-reciprocal emitter coupled radiatively to two reciprocal black bodies. So, uh, and moreover, as a typical thermodynamic argument, you can set all three objects here to have the same temperature. So in doing so, the black body A has a unity emissivity and the photon that it emits, part of it will be absorbed by the non-reciprocal emitter, and that's the term alpha A. Part of it would be reflected by the emitter to black body B, and that's the reflection coefficient A to B. And that has to be equal to unity because that's where the emitted photons go. Similarly, black body A has unity absorptivity. So that's the one on the right-hand side of this equation. And the emitted, the absorbed photon, excuse me, the absorbed photon comes part of it from the emission of the non-reciprocal emitter to black body A, part of it come from the reflection of the photon uh, from the black body B to the black body A. So then you have the second equation here. Now, looking at these two equations, you can immediately see 
that the following has to be true, that the absorption and emission difference between these two pathways, between the radiative exchange between black body A and the nine reciprocal emitter must be equal to the reflection coefficient between these two uh, reciprocal pathways. So consequently, if you can design an isolator where you have a contrast between the transport coefficient between these two pathways, that by the second law of thermodynamics would have required you to break the Kirchhoff law between emissivity and absorptivity. So we have in fact argued that the breaking of the Kirchhoff law is a consequence of the second law of thermodynamics for non-reciprocal thermal emitter. Now, from this, uh, I, uh, coming back to what we talk about, the time asymmetric uh, energy harvesting for solar cell, you will see that in order for this to work, uh, you not only would like to break the Kirchhoff law, in fact, you would like to maximally break it because what you would like to do is that when the cell emit, you do not want any photon to go back to the sun, but rather it will emit completely elsewhere. And therefore you will in fact want a emissivity and absorptivity contrast to go to unity. In other words, one would like maximum violence, violation of detail balance. And that, as we show uh, a few years ago, is something that you, in fact, you can do with appropriate photonic design. And to do that, you need materials. And you need non-reciprocal materials where the non-reciprocity occur in the thermal wavelengths range. And one way to do that so is to imagine a heavily doped semiconductor where the carrier are described as a free electron metal. So uh, the, uh, the dielectric response of this medium, uh, can, is, there's a simple model called the Drude model. So you imagine an electron uh, subject to a uh, external electric field, but moreover has internal damping as described by this friction term then you can write down the Newton's law for this electron. And from this, you can derive a dielectric permittivity of this metal, and which has this form that's just a standard root model. Now, to break the reciprocity, you can apply also a static magnetic field. When you do that, the electron is also subject to the Lorentz force. And consequently, now you have a dielectric permittivity tensor that is more complicated. But the important thing here is that now you have an asymmetric tensor and the off diagonal matrix element of the tensor then uh, break the reciprocity. And uh, in this case, the uh, strength of the reciprocity breaking come from what's called the cyclotron frequency divided by the plasma frequency. So the cyclotron frequency is reflect the fact that when you apply a magnetic field, the electron uh, goes around in circles and there's a characteristic frequency and the plasma frequency is related to the density of the electron and the strength of the, the, the non-reciprocity in the system depends on the ratio between these two frequency scale. So in Heavily doped semiconductor, the plasma frequency is in the thermal wavelengths range that allow you to use these material to control thermal radiation. And moreover, the ratio between the cyclotron frequency and the plasma frequency is on the order of 10 to minus two to 10 to minus three, that in fact gives you a very strong non-reciprocal response. Starting from this material, you can then design photonic structure that allow you maximum violation of detail balance. So uh, this is our uh, initial work where we imagine <coughs> Indian arsenide, heavily doped, an N-type Indian arsenide, 
we apply a static magnetic field, and we also put in grating on the Indian arsenide. And uh, in the first example, it's uh, the magnetic field is actually quite substantial. This is three Tesla. Uh, but theoretically, what you see is that after you apply the uh, magnetic field, the absorption and emission peak between these two pathways actually split. And at certain frequencies, you have near unity contrast between absorptivity and emissivity. And that gives you a near complete violation of detail balance. And uh, uh, it would be useful to reduce the magnetic field that's required uh, in this kind of construction. So uh, we then proceed uh, an idea where we again use the same material, magneto optical material of Indian arsenide, but instead of putting grating directly onto Indian arsenide, we put a silicon carbide grating on top so that we use the resonant behavior of the silicon carbide grating, which has lower loss, to break the reciprocity. Uh, in doing so, uh, one could actually get a magnetic field that's only 0.3 Tesla, and you can have a very strong contrast between absorptivity and emissivity in a particular direction. And this has been experimentally observed uh, in a collaboration with a Harry Atwater's group at Caltech with a paper that's currently under review. Now, uh, the underlying physical reason for seeing this kind of uh, 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 violation of Kirchhoff law come from analyzing the dispersion relation uh, of the guided resonance mode in the silicon carbide grating. So the dispersion relation relay the frequency to the wave vector as characterized by the angle of incidence. And uh, in the absence of magnetic field, it is symmetric with respect to a reflection around the normal instance direction. When you apply magnetic field, it become asymmetric, and that gives you a frequency range where you can violate the Kirchhoff law. So in this construction, we still require an external magnetic field. Uh, in recent years, uh, there has been an exciting development on magnetic wire semi-metal a new class of material that one way to think about it is that it has a very large internal magnetic field. So as a result, the system actually has non-reciprocal electromagnetic response without the need for any external magnetic field. And uh, moreover, the strength of the non-reciprocity here is about a hundred to a thousand times compared with standard magneto-optical material under reasonable magnetic field. So uh, therefore, it would be very exciting to explore the use of this material system for violating of Kirchhoff law as well. So we did some of the initial work where we take a, these magnetic wild semi-metal, put a grating there and show that again, you can see very large absorption emission contrast, but in this case, you do not need to apply any external magnetic field. And again, you see this very large asymmetry in the dispersion relation of the plasma in this system. So uh, they are in fact, uh, in, the, in the examples that I've shown you, the, uh, the uh, Kirchhoff flow violation comes from two reflection process. Uh, there are in fact other ways that you can design material structures that violate Kirchhoff law. So in a more recent work, we look at a semi-transparent radiator. Uh, in a semi-transparent non-reciprocal thermal radiator, instead of the reflection process I've talked about, we would try to design a structure where when light is coming in from the top, it will be perfectly absorbed. But when it's thermally emit, it doesn't emit back to the top, but instead emit further as it's going downward. 
And if you go through the analysis, similar to the reflection process, you can see that in order to achieve this kind of Kirchhoff law violation, you need a scattering matrix where the absorption is unity for light that's coming in from the top, but for light that's coming in from the bottom, there should not be any absorption and instead light will be completely transmitted. So uh, what we show is that you can actually construct a structure that satisfy these kind of non-reciprocal uh, thermal radiator behavior. So in this case, the gray region here are regular you understand? material. You have to observe reality. Observe. Sorry. <laughs> Excuse me? Yeah. Yeah, please, everyone, please make sure you're muted. Okay, yeah, sorry. I thought you were asking a question. Sorry. No, no. Okay, so uh, uh, the, um, the, the gray region here is a regular dielectric material. And the green region here is the non-reciprocal material that I talked about. And uh, without going into detail, we show that if light is coming from the top, the blue line here is the absorptivity. So it has a peak absorption. And also, but the emission for the light going back to the top, which is indicated uh, by the solid red line here is near zero. And instead, the emission uh, peak as it are uh, going downward as indicated by the solid red line. So in this case, you have a per near perfect absorber for light coming from the top. And when it emit, it goes entirely to the bottom. So uh, this, the examples that I just show you, the loss occur on the magneto-optical material. But on the other hand, you can do the same construction where the loss is instead put in in the semiconductor. So in this case, if you imagine you have low loss magneto-optical material as the green region here, and that you have a reciprocal semiconductor like what you typically use in a solar cell, again, in the same configuration, you can achieve the semi-transparent non-reciprocal uh, absorption behavior, but all the loss goes into a semiconductor. So with this discussion on the semi-transparent non-reciprocal semiconductor absorber, uh, I would now like to talk about a construction. I think that's a lot simpler than Dries engine, but is capable of reaching the Langsberg limit. And that's the non-reciprocal multi-junction cell that we have recently introduced. So the idea, uh, but again, as a background, uh, since Ree's initial work, there has been a number of work where I try to construct schemes to reach the Langsberg limit. Uh, so uh, Martin Green, in his very well-known book, take Ries engine and replace each of the engine by multi-junction cell with infinite number of junctions to show that this also reached Langsberg limit. In a subsequent work, he have got rid of the circulator and instead use a non-reciprocal reflector, the one that I was talking about in the beginning and together with multi-junction cells uh, and again shows that you can reach the Langsberg limit. These, in my view, are still very complicated device configuration. What we recently show, and the paper just came out in nanoletters, uh, is that you can construct a non-reciprocal multi-junction cell where each of uh, this look like a regular multi-junction cell. So each semiconductor has different band gap the one that has the largest gain band gap is on top, and the one that's at the bottom uh, is at the lowest band gap, like the regular multi-junction cell, except that these are non-reciprocal layers. The absorption, it absorbs all the light coming from above band gap, but when it emits, it doesn't emit back, but instead emit forward. 
And uh, excuse me. Um, and we show theoretically that if you perform a detailed balance calculation, this in fact can reach the Langsberg limit if you have an infinite number of these layers. You can also compute the efficiency of these cells with finite number of semiconductor layer. And moreover, you can compare this with standard, not a reciprocal multi-junction cells. So in the reciprocal multi-junction cell, if you have finite number of layers uh, to improve the efficiency, uh, what you need to do is to put in a reciprocal fil low pass filter to reflect any emission from the front cell back to itself. So the idea here is to make sure that the photon, the high energy photon never reach the low energy semiconductor. And uh, when, if you have infinite number of cells, you don't have to do this. But for finite number of cells, you actually need to put in this low pass filter. So in our case, there's no need for putting any of these low pass filter. And we can then compare the efficiency of the reciprocal to the non-reciprocal multi-junction cell in the case where we have number of layers that are finite. What we see is that in the infinite layer limit, our setup reached the Langsberg limit of 93%, and the standard setup reached the multicolor limit of 86%. And moreover, as long as you increase the number of layers beyond unity, the non-reciprocal cell outperform the reciprocal cell. So I think this indicate that even though we're talking about theoretical limit, it is actually interesting to explore these kind of non-reciprocal multi-junction cell in a practical configuration as well. So uh, in the maybe last five or 10 minutes or so, I like to switch gear a little bit and talk about some of the unusual things in non-reciprocal thermal radiation in terms of what we call a thermal supercar. So as a way of background, uh, uh, heat transfer, in fact, is very much similar to the electric current that you are used to. So uh, typically, if you need to have electric current, you need to have a voltage bias. So uh, in a normal conductor, to get a current, you basically put a voltage gradient across it to drive it. And uh, you can get a current only if you put a voltage. And this process then inherently generate heat and entropy. Similarly, in radiative heat transfer, as well as in conductive heat transfer, to get a heat flow, you would need to two objects at a different temperature. And in this case, again, the non-zero heat current occur only in the presence of non-zero temperature gradient. And this kind of heat transfer process is also associated with entropy generation, as I talked about in the very beginning. Now, in electric, uh, uh, in, uh, electric current, it is known that in fact, you can have a persistent current flow without voltage gradient. A superconductor, for example, can sustain a current without a voltage. Similarly, the one-way edge state in a, uh, a quantum Hall state, in the ideal case, can also carry a persistent current without voltage gradient. So therefore, naturally, one should ask, whether it's possible to generate a persistent heat flow in the absence of temperature gradient. In other words, can we create a thermal supercurrent? So uh, this is somewhat unusual, and uh, therefore it would be important to work out what the basic constraints are that prevent you from seeing a thermal supercurrent in typical systems. And uh, the first constraint 
is that in fact, you need to involve uh, more than two bodies. If you have two body at the same temperature, at equilibrium, the heat flow on both direction must be the same as required by the second law. So you are not gonna see any persistent current. And uh, so you need at least three bodies. And in fact, the configuration I'm gonna show you are going to be involving three spheres. The second thing, as it turned out, that you need to do is to break reciprocity. As it turned out, this is proved mathematically uh, by uh, Kruger in uh, Moran Kadas group at MIT. Uh, if you have even multiple bodies, but if they are made of non-reciprocal materials, uh, made of reciprocal materials, excuse me, then if they all, if two of the object in this body has the same temperature, the heat flow between them must be balanced out. So the net heat flow between them must be zero. And therefore, uh, based upon this, we consider a geometry that looks like this, where we have three endoped Indian antimony nanospheres forming an equilateral triangle and the system is equilibrium, and we apply a magnetic field to break reciprocity. And when we do the theoretical current, the theoretical calculation, we indeed see that the heat flux going from one to two is different from heat flux going from two to one when the magnetic field is applied, even at equilibrium. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't apply magnetic field, then these two heat flux are identical to each other. And you see this persistent heat current even after you integrate all the wavelengths. And this is a visualization of this heat flow. So the plot here is the pointing flux, which measures the heat flow amplitude at a particular wavelength. Uh, as driven by thermal fluctuation. So the calculation is something called fluctuation electrodynamics, where we put in randomly fluctuating, uh, randomly fluctuating source on each of these spheres. And then we calculate the electric field, electromagnetic field, and we calculate the pointing flux. The fluctuation is completely random, but the pointing flux has a well-defined direction and that's the direction of the heat flow uh, direction. So uh, you can uh, compute this for a larger number of spheres. And moreover, again, um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip this. Uh, in fact, you can see the signature of it in the non-equilibrium situation as well, which might be more amenable for experimental demonstration. Now, to end the talk, I like to comment on the implication of this thermal heat current in the energy harvesting. So uh, it is commonly believed that you can reach carnal efficiency limit, but you can reach that only with zero power. And here is one argument of it. So suppose you, for example, bought an engine from Carnot somehow uh, that can uh, give you uh, energy efficiency reaching the Carnot limit. And you are then, of course, very eager to use that to harvest work from a heat source at a temperature T1 and a heat sink at a temperature T2. So to do that, what you do is you connect one end of your Carnot engine to the heat source and another end of your Carnot engine to the heat sink. And so there's going to be a heat flow from the external heat source to one end of your Carnot engine. And suppose you do that with a conductive heat transfer, then the amount of heat flow is then proportional to the temperature difference between the heat source and the terminal of your Carnot engine. So uh, then the Carnot engine would be able to take the incoming heat flux 
and convert it to work. So the efficiency in this case then of your entire system is the Carnot efficiency, but for the temperature of the terminals of the Carnot engine and the total work that you generate is this efficiency multiplied by the incoming heat flux. So if you would like to have a uh, efficiency reaching the Carnot limit, then the temperature of the terminal of the Carnot engine must be the same as the temperature of the heat source. But in this case, in the regular conductive heat flow, you will have zero incoming heat flow and therefore you get zero power. So in other words, this construction gives you an indication that to reach Carnot limit, you actually must have zero power coming out. And if you look carefully at this argument, you see that the key point here is that in a regular heat flow to deliver power, you non-zero power, you must have non-zero temperature gradient and non-zero temperature gradient on the other hand is associated with entropy generation. So this gives an interesting observation that one may be able to remove the power efficiency trade-off by feeding heat into a Carnot engine, not with regular heat current, but with supercurrent. So uh, in other words, you may imagine a setup where the terminal of the Carnot engine has exactly the same temperature as the terminal of a heat source, but you feed it not with the regular current, but with thermal supercurrent. So in fact, if you look at Ries engine, you see a circulating photon flow as generated by the circulators. And uh, starting from this, in fact, you can construct a photon engine that reach the Carnot efficiency limit and non-zero power limit. So uh, this is the construction that we uh, essentially copied from Ries engine, but we use this to construct an engine that harvest energy between a heat source and the heat sink at the Carnot efficiency limit at non-zero power density. In fact, this, the power density is exactly the radiative heat exchange between a hot side and the cold side. So what we do is we take the Ries engine on the cold side and we put a complementary heat engine on the hot side. And in this case, the circulating photon flow in fact is enough to deliver the power from the hot side to the cold side without any entropy loss. And that gives you the possibility of reaching the Carnot efficiency, but not at zero power density, but in fact at maximum power density. So in this case, it does involve the use of infinite number of engines. And I think in fact, this is a requirement because to reach Carnot efficiency limit, you cannot have any entropy generation. So you cannot have any non-zero temperature difference. And therefore you need a temperature difference between each of these objects to go to zero. But as I mentioned in the non-reciprocal junction cell, this setup in fact also indicate that you get a efficiency gain with a finite number of these engines um, and that could be, uh, could be interesting in practice, in practice. And moreover, uh, our setup of a non-reciprocal multi-junction cell indicate that we might be able to do the same thing with non-reciprocal, with those kind of non-reciprocal cell as well. And that could be important for thermal photovoltaics. So with that, uh, let me summarize. Um, I hope 
to uh, point out some of the uh, very unusual connection between photon and thermodynamics. And in particular, the uh, non-reciprocity, which is uh, quite an unusual effect on the photon side, as well as the very important implication of non-reciprocity on thinking about thermodynamics of light. Um, I don't think I can answer Charles' question on how I think about photon, because uh, it is such a vast subject. But I would say that even in this maybe relatively narrow corner of uh, trying to harvest sunlight at theoretical limit, uh, there are a lot that you can think about. So with that, let me stop and thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, such a, a clear and uh, exciting presentation and some really uh, potentially very impactful work on your non-reciprocal multi-junction solar cells. Uh, do you guys have a plan of trying to uh, build one of those devices and, and test it? Uh, so uh, we are uh, thinking about it uh, at the moment. Uh, we are, uh, the first thing we will hope to do is to demonstrate a semi-transparent absorber that, that yes. we talked about. And I yes. think it is actually quite likely that that's doable. Yes, I see. Um, what, what sort of material would you use for that? Uh, so, uh, in fact, I think uh, one can do magnetic wow semi-metal embedded on a semiconductor. Oh, I see. Yeah. Do you... Um, do you have a feeling where physically the internal magnetic field in the magnetic wild semi-metal comes from? How does that uh, physically happen? It, it does use, uh, some of the atom has a magnetic moment. I see. So, so if you, uh, I mean, my most naive picture is that you have atom with magnetic moment, and if it's uh, either ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic, this moment will, will, uh, will align, and therefore you will have an internal magnetic field. I see. So there are more fancy ways to say this. Uh, I'm not sure what I said is completely accurate, but this is my hand-waving argument. You can talk about barrier curvatures or wild points and so on, but... Uh, but but that's hard to imagine. Right. It, it you know, I, I think about it as a topological effect, but maybe it's actually you're saying more of an atomic effect, or is it a common? Uh, it is a topological like effect. So at the end of the day, uh, it turned out that this internal um, uh, time reversal symmetry breaking uh, give you a. Uh, uh, give you a band structure, a separation, a wild node at the same energy, which break time reversal symmetry that translate into an effective magnetic field that's very large. Yes, I see. Yeah, but yeah. but it's very hard to, I, I can say it without uh, hesitation, <laughs> but, uh, but, but I'm not sure how intuitive that thing really is. <laughs> right. I right. see uh, magnetic atom stable. Yes, yes. Um, so any other questions for Professor Fan? Um, you know, so the, the, the thought about the detailed balance not being a requirement of the second law, how common do you think that knowledge is in, in academia? Um, cause. Um, so, um, I suppose the, um, is not commonly talked about in textbook. Uh, in fact, if you open many of the standard textbook, uh, it may be there's a sentence somewhere. But, yes. uh, but uh, uh, I guess in the, the typical thermal radiation presentation in the textbook, uh, the whole book are on reciprocal system and the non-reciprocity probably has a, is in the footnote. I see. So yeah. it is known, but I think it is extremely important, at least that's my view, uh, but, uh, uh, but then people write a thousand page book and, uh, uh, and <laughs> I think mention this only in a footnote. So, so uh, it is known, uh, I cannot say it's not known.
Right, right. So it might be interesting for the discussion on Saturday with uh, when they're going to be talking about potential violations of the second law or ways, you know, that's kind of a, uh, I even don't like saying that, I guess, but. Um. Uh, right. I don't think I've been ever been that ambitious about uh, figuring out a way to violate second law. Um, I uh, not, None of the stuff that we talk about here uh, violate second law. It is right. within the confinement of second law. Uh, but I perhaps would like to say that even within the constrictly within the confinement of second law, uh, there are in fact many interesting things you can do. Right, that's a great point, right? I have a question about that, if I may. Yeah. So it's, it's a basic question. So if you can violate detailed balance. And is that always out of equilibrium or can you violate detailed balance in equilibrium? I, I always thought, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, I, I interrupted. I always thought detailed balance was sort of a kinetic expression of equilibrium. Uh, it's not. And so you violate detailed balance at some equilibrium. The point is that you, the second law comes back because you have circulating current. Let me uh, let me see if I can uh, just point to a uh, point to. Uh, in fact, this picture uh, uh, says what the detail balance is and uh, why you can violate that. You can see that you have a current that goes around. But, and for every suppose the th uh, equilibrium. For every object, the incoming flux balance out the outgoing flux. So there's no second law issue, but the detailed balance would have dictated that the direction of these arrows are the same, and that's not required by second law. Uh, this is in fact, uh, has a long history. Uh, we probably look at it uh, first in the photon heat flow. Uh, but on Sager, in his uh, very well-known paper on detail balance, uh, if you look at his uh, discussion of on Sager relation, this is the uh, 1931 paper, uh, explicitly already point out that in chemical reaction, uh, you can have a circulating thing like this in chemical reaction if you break time reversal symmetry. Thank you. Yeah, so detail balance, in fact, is not a second law requirement. Any other questions? Thoughts? Um, yeah. So, yeah, go yeah. ahead. I have comments here. I think very good talk and very interesting. Uh, Actually, we now find out this, uh, you know, it's um, um, environment temperature can be utilized isothermally by biological system with protons. So this will be talk, I'm gonna talk about Saturday, okay? It's okay. very similar to, uh, relate to you. So actually what you show is legitimate. It's really totally reasonable. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Second law is not universal, okay? Mm -hmm. There are two type of energy processes. We now find B. You know, what you see in the last part is type B energy processes. Majority we see in the world, we everybody understand is A, you know, that follows second law. But the other type is because they have asymmetric, you see some maybe have some asymmetric function there that align to that circular curling or heat curling, okay? Or something like that going on. <laughs> That's just my comment, okay? You have to have- um, Yeah, so uh, maybe in response to that, I think at least I would say that in our case, uh, mm -hmm. we are strictly following second law. Yeah. Well, within mm -hmm. second law. So in fact, the results, I consistently say where we can get to carnal efficiency limit, not right. what, when we can exceed carnal efficiency limit. So That's in right. our case, uh, we do not generate any work if the system is in equilibrium. Mm -hmm. uh, the non-reciprocity give us the possibility perhaps in think about reaching the carnal efficiency limit at non-zero power density. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it does not exceed the, uh, at a strict equilibrium, 
everything that we talk about here give you exactly zero power density generation. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that I, I state that unexpli uh, explicitly. I think, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one thing I've uh, wondered about is the differential versus the interval form of Kirchhoff's law. Yes. And, um, you know, Landau has a nice description of the in integral form of Kirchhoff's law. And I've always thought, well, in our measurements, you know, when we're measuring something, there's always a line width, right? And there's always some angle. Yeah. And so we never actually ever measure the differential form exactly. We're always measuring an integral form because we're measuring over some frequency and some angle. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, so we, it depends on how wide you integrate. If you integrate all angle, uh, there's no frequency conversion in this particular thing. So you can imagine it meshing only a single frequency, but if you integrate all angle, they balance out. Yes. And that, I think that is second law requirement, actually. That yes. you cannot touch. But uh, if you only measure a small range of angles, then uh, these structures do violate the detailed form of it. Or if the, let's say the partial integral form of it uh, can be violated. Yes. But if you integrate from, uh, integrate the entire solid angle, uh, you should not be able to get any, uh, any imbalance because uh, I think that violates second law. Yes. Thank you, yes. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the way I think about it, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, experimentally, uh, one, and in fact, we start to be able to see it as well, that you do violate the detail balance. You do violate the, uh, the uh, partial integrated form because as you mentioned, any experiment, you ma don't measure a single angle. Yes. Right. So it does violate that. Hey, Eric, uh, you have a question? Yeah, I have a, a way, way outside of the box question. Uh, and I, you know, it's hard to really think if this is a good question or not, because it's uh, pretty fast here. But, you know, you, you need this uh, nonlinear relationship and you need a constant uh, potential difference, so to speak. So gravity gives you that. It gives you a one over R squared um, gradient. And I'm just wondering if you could, you know, I'm just thinking way outside the box, if you build a contraption that goes vertically and just uses, uh, somehow uses uh, the slight differences in gravity uh, to give you some type of, uh, of gravity energy harvesting. You know, I'm just looking at your diagrams and, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're thermodynamic and they're, you, know, you have a thermal pho photovoltaic uh, system there, but yeah. I, I don't know. You know, it, you know, there's piezoelectrics that uh, that will produce current. Uh, you know, based on uh, pressure. Uh, do, you have, do you have any just quick thoughts on that? Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, it's a very interesting thing because uh, Charles and I talked about it as well. Uh, the uh, gravity. Uh, especially when you couple to vacuum fluctuation uh, is I think an inherently non-equilibrium uh, situation. If you have a gravity, uh, I think from thermodynamic point of view, you are not at equilibrium. Uh, this you can see from uh, either Hawking radiation or Unruh effect, right? Unruh effect essentially indicates that it's not even gravity. If you have acceleration, there's a temperature associated with it, right? This is what Unruh effect says. Gravity is the curvature and the acceleration is not even curvature. So uh, I think in system with gravity, if you, cut, if you put the zeros order coupling to vacuum fluctuation, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the thermal equilibrium already disappear. So therefore I think it is possible uh, to harvest that if necessary from gravity. Uh, I, on the other hand, would have said that, of course, there are far easier ways to harvest energy from gravity, right? I, let me do this. Um, and that harvested already. So, so I, uh, but, but I think fundamentally it is uh, it's very interesting. Uh, one thing um, I mentioned to Charles uh, 
because I saw that in a documentary is that some of the satellite uh, of um, uh, of uh, some of the some of the satellite of one of the planet in in the solar system in fact get heat up because of the tidal force uh, of the uh, coming from gravity give you friction and heat it up so uh, and that gives you volcano uh, activities even though there's no inner core of the system so so in fact uh, yes uh, I, I think uh, harvesting energy from gravity uh, fundamentally is interesting because it's a uh, even from a thermodynamic point of view, is inherent in a non-equilibrium system. Thank you. Yeah, so that, that example of like Jupiter and Io, I think. Io, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, is um, an example of a conversion of gravity to electromagnetic or thermal fluctuations, right? right? Heat, gravity right? forces yeah. to heat thermal fluctuations will radiate and um, somehow there's a tie to what uh, Professor Chow is going to talk about on Friday, I believe. He has some thoughts on converting gravity waves to electromagnetics. But, you know, in my mind, gravity is already, as you pointed out, shown to be able to convert to um, an electromagnetic phenomena. Yeah. The other thing, I, I wonder if Eric was thinking about a gravitational supercurrent, just like a thermal supercurrent or a um, persistent current in a superconductor. Can we make a gravitational supercurrent? We would have to make, I suppose, a non-reciprocal gravity thing, or I don't know. Is that what you were thinking about, Eric? I... Yes. I mean, I I, uh, I didn't think of the word supercurrent. I should have thought of it because of the presentation here, but... Uh... Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I, I'm just thinking just piezoelectrics uh, work uh, work on this process where they, you know, they'll generate, I don't know a lot about them, but they'll generate electricity with pressure. And I just don't know, I'm just trying to think of a way to do this. I, I calculated, the, I mean, if you can, if you have a propellant, propellantless propulsion device that can generate uh, enough Newtons per watt, you can actually harvest gravity uh, by just lifting something up and dropping it, because um, you know right. you'll, you'll have right you'll, your your uh, acceleration will, will out, outdo uh, gravity. But um, I, I'm just trying to think of a stable, non-moving system where you yeah. just stack stack something up. Uh, you know, obviously water mills turn with water. And, mm -hmm. You know, that, that's yeah. a very efficient way. But I'm just trying to think of just something related to this. Yes. Yeah, so I don't know if uh, Lance or Nathan or Ron might have a comment about that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if they're here. But anyway, so yeah, interesting, interesting thought. So um, yeah, I, I think that, might... uh, it, it's a very interesting uh, statement. I think that uh, uh, I don't know uh, these issues on potentially breaking uh, reciprocity or breaking time reversal symmetry has been extensively looked at in a gravity context. So, so that actually could be interesting, actually. I think it does break a uh, time reversal symmetry. If you have a rotating uh, metric, for example, a rotating black hole, for example, right, right. Uh, the, there's the, there is a gravity uh, analogy of the Lorentz force, and that, of course, should break reciprocity. So. So right, uh, right. So, so you do uh, break reciprocity that way. Hmm. Uh, can you imagine the uh, the equations of a, a non-reciprocal uh, tensor for gravity? I, <laughs> I think uh, I, I I think one should look into, but I suspect that the uh, the metric uh, associated with say the Kerr solution of the rotating black hole. Uh, 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 must uh, break reciprocity uh, for yes. at least for the phenomena associated with it, because uh, uh, because the the zeros well the lowest order uh, thing about a, a mass current uh, is a force that look exactly like Lorentz force. So yes. uh, so I think that uh, that. Uh, it has a strong analogy to uh, to uh, to Lorentz force in electromagnetism. Hmm. Interesting. 
Yeah, and Nathan is going to talk about gravitational induction uh, and conversion to electromagnetics mm -hmm. on Friday as well. So, mm -hmm. Eric, you might want to tune into that uh, if you have interest. Yeah. So let's, gonna, uh, let's. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Let's thank uh, Professor Fan again, and um, thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. A wonderful presentation. Yeah, and so now you. we have a, a short one-hour uh, lunch break. And then um, Igor from University of Maryland is going to talk about the effective mass of a photon in a tapered cavity and the potential really high accelerations that are predicted and may even relate to some of these EM um, thruster cavities. I'm not sure, but uh, very, very interesting idea. I'd love to. And I think he has seen some data that indicates that this does happen. And hopefully uh, he'll be sharing that as well. So that's at um, 2.30. So I'll see you back then. Thank you.